Good afternoon and welcome back from the social lounge. I hope you are all having good conversations. It's always a shame to stop those conversations, but uh, um, we do want to try to keep on schedule if we can. My name is Mark Urban Lorraine. I'm the secretary of the Society for Scientific Exploration and I'm co-host for this uh, particular session. And I'm pleased to be able to introduce Lloyd Auerbach, who is the director of the Office of Paranormal Investigations and the president of the Forever Family Foundation. He has been in the field for over 40 years, focusing on education and field investigations. He's the author or co-author of 10 nonfiction books and one novel. He teaches online parapsychology courses through the Rhine Education Center. His media experiences on TV, radio, and in print number in the thousands, including the Unexplained, ESPN's Sports Center, ABC's The View, Oprah, and Larry King Live. He works as a parapsychologist, professional mentalist, psychic entertainer as Professor Paranormal, and has a public speaking and media skills coach and as a professional chocolatier. So um, a wide and a diverse range of uh, backgrounds for Lloyd. So without further ado, I'll start the uh, playback. And uh, please, if as you're listening to the talk, as you have questions, put them in the Q&A, not in the chat, please. All right. Thank you very much. Next, uh, I guess, half an hour or so, 35 minutes or so, I'm going to try to collapse what uh, we cover in a lot of our classes at the Ryan Center into just one quick overview session to kind of give you an introduction. So first, my favorite quote, and all my students see this, science fiction writers Kathleen Sky. there's no such thing as the supernatural. They're only things we don't understand yet. I think that's just simply a key statement for science in general. Okay, so we the title of this is Paranormal Investigations, and I'm gonna to get to what that actually means for us, but contrary to the reality shows, because unfortunately the paranormal TV shows, the reality shows have created um, on the negative, some real misconceptions. On the positive, it's brought a lot more people to, I guess you could say to the playground to play with it. We just wanna make sure that they know what they're doing. So the paranormal as a term is a much, much more than ghosts and hauntings. It has been applied, of course, beyond psychic phenomena to also include things that are unexplained. Uh, we deal mainly with investigations in, with apparitions, hauntings, and poltergeists. I'll get into that in a bit. But those are psychic or psi experiences. And there's a big disconnect with the paranormal reality shows that seems they seem to think on the shows, or at least they put out the idea, that these are not connected to ESP or connected to psychokinesis. So all three, all three of these fall under spontaneous psi experiences. All of them start out with a human witness or an experiencer if we're gonna investigate. And I'll explain why that is. Unlike the TV shows, there is no technology that can detect psi phenomena, that can detect ghosts. No matter what they say on TV, there's nothing that we have for sure that can detect apparitions. So technology is absolutely secondary to human experience. And also we never, well, I should say, we almost never investigate in the dark. It would have to be that rare case where people are only having an experience when all the lights are out and it's the middle of the night. And the thing that really always gets me, uh, and I've been on panels at some of the ghost conferences, the, the ghost hunter conferences, where some folks from TV will say that there's nothing beyond the 1990s. There's over 140 years of scientific investigation of these things. And most ghost hunters, many, many people who follow the TV shows are totally unaware of this. So why do we investigate? Well. We investigate anything to solve a mystery in some respects, but we get, we, from a scientific perspective, we're trying to gather data to understand a particular phenomenon or a, a group of phenomena. We wanna understand and eliminate the normal explanations when we do investigations and research. We wanna be able to form questions, hypotheses, and if possible, test them much harder in the field than it is in the laboratory. We wanna re replicate the work of other researchers, certainly in the laboratory and controlled research, Again, tougher to do in a field investigation where you are not in control of the environment. We do wanna increase our knowledge in general of the phenomena and the experiences. And of course, 
this is something I'll talk about at the very end. We want to help the experiencers when they are asking for help. Of course, there are a lot of folks who just simply want to go out and have an experience of their own, and that's okay as long as you are keeping other things in mind. So I mentioned that these are, we're dealing with spontaneous psi experiences. And of course, these are psychic phenomena or experiences that happen beyond the controlled conditions that you find in a laboratory. So they also are typically the uncontrolled experiences of normal people. We call those spontaneous. But in many respects, when a psychic or medium does something, we still consider that a spontaneous psi experience, even though they are in control and a conscious control, because it's not under controlled conditions. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but when we talk about field work or field research or experiences we can look at outside the laboratory, it is all of these. We don't investigate necessarily all of these. We may get reports of all of them and work with people or inform them about all of these. And what we've learned over the years, both from, the, from working with people's spontaneous experiences and from laboratory findings, but these are all on the continuum of psychic experiences or psi experiences. On the recurrent front, which is what we want to look at, we want to look at not just one-time experiences, but the recurrent experiences. We're dealing with our big three, the apparitions, hauntings, and poltergeists. That's our typical paranormal investigations. However, one can also be uh, a field investigator looking at cases of the reincarnation type, such as what Jim Tucker does and others, and Jim Matlock and others have done working with children who remember previous lives. Um, I personally have been involved in a number of investigations of the claimed abilities of various psychics and mediums, some of which have turned out to be genuine, and unfortunately, some of which have turned out to be absolute frauds. In some instances, instances not even good frauds. Um, so we are really looking at the experiences and the reports, and reports are important, of people even in the cases where it seems the phenomena exists on its own. And what that means is, if you have a situation where there is truly an apparition, a conscious person without their body, so someone who has survived the death of their body, they exist on their own. We, we don't need any witnesses. But in order for us to investigate, unless the apparition happened to come into uh, contact me directly, which has not happened yet, uh, we have to have the experiences of witnesses. We have to have reports from witnesses so we can't deal directly with the phenomena unless it, it becomes evident to us directly. So let's take a look at these three different things that we're dealing with here. Uh, one of them is hauntings. Now on TV, you'll hear this referred to as residual hauntings. And psychics talk about imprints. They talk about psychic residue. Um, the term place memory is an old term that we've been using again since probably around the late 1990s. And I think it actually uh, really encapsulates what we're dealing with most of the time. It's as if the location or sometimes an object, because it can be an object, seems to hold information about its history, possibly recent history, possibly older history. And how we as witnesses, as experiencers pick this up would either be through a form of clairvoyance, ESP essentially, of the location or of the object and its history, or, you know, there's always a possibility that this, that there is something going on in the physical environment that can eventually be understood from a physics, a current physics perspective and the human brain and how it's picking up information from the environment. So we have to consider that as a possibility. It may not be purely a psychic thing, even though it's still a function of consciousness in that sense. Uh, one of the ways to look at this is if you know of the phenomena or the ability of psychometry which is something that psychics have talked about for hundreds of years, the idea that you can touch or hold an object and pick up information about where that object's been, who its owner is, that sort of thing. It's history, essentially. And it's actually not too hard for people to learn this. I've taught a number of my students to do this. Uh, I've done it on occasion myself. I know psychics, really good psychics, who've been able to do this very well and work with police over the years. So if you think about psychometry, picking up information from something about that object, something about that thing. When you're in a house, you're picking up information from that house. That's a form of psychometry. That's a form of clairvoyance or ESP in general. So 
the thing to remember, and this is an important distinction between this and apparitions, and that is that while pop culture tells us that something terrible must have happened in this location, a suicide, a murder, a knockdown, drag out fight, a massacre, a battle, something like that. So it seems to relate to death. That's not the case. It's the living, perhaps in the process of dying, perhaps not, but it's the living who leave the impressions behind. And those living people of us who are witnesses, we come along, we pick up the information, we might pick it up visually, we might pick it up auditorily, we might feel something. In other words, we process the information, the perception of the information is processed as if it's similar or as if it is a sensory experience, when in fact it's an extra or non-sensory experience, bit of information. Now, when I, I really wanna distance this from death for a couple of reasons. One, because you can pick up information, whether it's in a haunted house or on an object using psychometry from the previous owner, or even the current owner, that person's alive. People have reported seeing and hearing things related to living people, even to themselves over the years. And to give you a really good understanding of this, and this is the way I've had to explain this to some of the ghost hunters out there. I can watch movies from the 1930s. Now, those movies were made when those people were alive. No one in that film, when it was made, was, had died, unless they had died before the film was released. But when they are actually filming, they were all alive. Decades later, they're all dead. They're all deceased. I can still watch that movie. So I am watching a recording of living people from the 1930s. Think of a haunting that way. It's a recording of an event that might've been a week ago or 50 years ago or much longer than that. We pick it up, we become the playback, we become the projector, we become the DVD player and so on. We become living YouTube, you might say. The term apparition actually goes back to the 19th century in common usage in the field of psychical research. And while ghosts can almost be used interchangeably, and you'll see that, you know, I might mention that, um, use that term a number of times, because most people seem to think of ghosts as a spirit of someone who used to live. That's actually not how that term is always used. Uh, but when we're talking about apparitions, think of an apparition, a ghost, as that which is perceived. And it's always important to remember there's a difference between perception and what our senses pick up. So I perceive, not with my eyes, not with my ears, I don't sense, I perceive information that relates to and allows me to see or seemingly see or hear or feel or smell something that apparently interacts. It seems to be related to some part of the human personality, whether you want to call that mind or soul or spirit that can, again, somehow exist in our physical universe after the death of that person's body. But also, because we have a category of apparitions, of living apparitions, potentially that apparition is someone who is projected outside their body. So perhaps they have had an out-of-body experience or are having an out-of-body experience and they travel somewhere and somebody sees them. That's an apparition of the living. We focus on apparitions in our investigations of humans, but reports do come in of animals, especially pets. We always have to remember here though, it's really important that we consider there are two sides to what's going on psychically using, using psi. There is the apparition. And there is you, the witness. You are receiving information, which then plays back in some way. You perceive in a visual, auditory, in some way. And not everybody perceives apparitions the same way, even in the same case. So you perceive this. How are you getting that information? That apparition doesn't have a physical form to reflect or give off light. So your eyes are not picking that thing, that person up. They do not have vocal cords in which to make or move, to make sound, to move the air, to create a physical sound. So it's all, think of it as a psychic, bit of psychic information. So you are being psychic. You are using psi, consciously, unconsciously, to perceive that apparition. And that apparition is using psi. They don't have a body. They don't have physical senses. They're using psi to 
actually interact. I mean, if you were if you were dead and you didn't have a physical body, you have no eyes to see, how do you see the world? Well, you'd have to be using something that is non-sensory. It's still perception, but it's non-sensory and we would call that ESP. And then if they actually move an object, that is psychokinesis, that is mind over matter, whether it's a human being who's alive who does it or a human being who's deceased who does it. When we compare the two, and this is a kind of a key thing when we're doing investigations, we have to do this uh, in any investigation where there is a human figure scene, for example. First, we consider apparitions as consciousness. App because of that, when an apparition is of <clears throat> someone who is, whose personality or is survived the death of their body, we see this as evidence for survival of bodily death. Of course, it can be interpreted from a super ESP perspective, from a purely materialist perspective, but it can be applied as evidence for, for survival. Apparitions, again, can be of deceased people or living individuals, either one. They are typically, and that should be a not, are not typically repetitive or acting in a pattern. Although I can't rule that out because, you know, it's possible that the, that the apparition is somebody when they were alive that had OCD, so that they are repeating themselves over and over and over again. But that's really rare. All right, hauntings, again, thinking of them as recordings, are seemingly location or object bound where apparitions are not. Um, while apparitions tend to stick in one location, that's based on the person who the apparition represents. Uh, they tend to go to an, a place that is, was associated with them when they were alive, whether it is back to their home, to their family, to the bar or restaurant they used to frequent, to the hotel they worked at, to the aircraft carrier that they had real fond memories of. Um, but they ten, tend to stick around one location, but they certainly don't are not stuck there, whereas hauntings are location bound because it's related to the information in the environment. Hauntings cannot be applied to evidence for survival any more than that 1930s movie can be applied as evidence for survival of the people in that film. Hauntings can be of deceased or of living people or of recent activity or older activity. But again, the activity happened when they were alive and, in, and there are hauntings where they do relate to a battle or they do relate to a murder or something like that. Uh, but the, the recording tends to end when that person has died. You don't see a recording, a haunting of a dead body. So here we're looking for the difference being uh, because hauntings are repetitive, they tend to have a pattern. We're looking for interactivity versus repetition. Poltergeist phenomena or recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, it happens again and again, it is spontaneous or uncontrolled and it is mind over matter. Uh, that is related to living agent PK. So we tend to look at activity in cases and poltergeist cases are all about physical activity that this relates to a living person in the environment or perhaps to the psychology of a group, of a family. The model is itself, the RSPK model goes back to 1958 and a case <clears throat> in Long Island that William Roll and J.G. Pratt did. And all, although there, there are much earlier roots, there are kind of writings and murmurings from Nandor Fodor and others in the early part of the 20th century about this idea. And there have been hypotheses that have been tested in cases to get the phenomena to stop or determine who might be at the center of the poltergeist case. So you might want to take a look at the work of Bill Roll, Tony Cornell, Scott Rogo, and definitely Nandor Fodor. So one thing I learned over the last few years, purely by accident and conversing on email for, with a couple of folks in the UK, is that the term poltergeist, it seems in the US, we kind of follow the Bill Roll model, but I've known people in the UK, as I learned uh, from Guy Lyon Playfair a number of years ago, where the term poltergeist refers to any case where there's physical activity, and then they might break it out when they determine that there might be an apparition there versus it's a living agent. Whereas we use that term to start with living agent situations and with apparitions a little different. So let's take a look at that particular thing. So uh, this comparison, poltergeist cases, when we use that term, they're typically physical activity only. Uh, there is, they're missing apparitional sightings. And when there are figures seen, they tend to be archetypal or dreamlike. 
not representing actual people. They generally connect to a living person in the situation. So you can play detective and figure out who's at the center of all this. Although again, it could be the psychology of a family that's involved. They're generally very chaotic. When I say uh, they, the activity in the cases are, is chaotic. It doesn't really follow a rhyme or reason. Although the types of items that move or the kind of phenomena that's happening may relate to that living person, to that poltergeist agent, to that person's psychology. Whereas apparitions, they can occasionally include physical activity, but apparitional PK tends to be very purposeful, non-chaotic, uh, a little playful uh, in some respects. It can get chaotic if, and I've seen this in the literature and in cases I've even had, where the people tend are absolutely purposely ignoring the apparition because they don't want to believe he or she exists. And that apparition gets a little upset and throws a temper tantrum. Um, usually stops almost immediately as soon as they pay attention. They're generally uh, independent of whether anyone is living there or working there or even present. So we have this kind of distinction between these cases. Now, we focus on the high impact experiences in most of our, our investigations. I have not had reports <coughs> of children remembering previous lives. It is not my specialty. Uh, I'd be very happy to get involved in investigating those, but I would tend to refer those out to the specialists in our field. But again, with these three, with apparitions, hauntings, and poltergeists, you do want to remember that even though there is an apparition there, there is the ESP or psi of the witnesses. With hauntings, there's possibly an imprint in the environment, but there is the ability of the witnesses to pick up the information. And poltergeists are all about living agents. So all of these involve psi abilities. And when I've heard some at some of the conferences that I used to go to, the ghost conferences, or seen some things posted on the web or on social media that uh, ghost hunters don't need to know anything about ESP, that's absurd uh, because those things, these things do not exist in a vacuum. So what do we investigate? Well, we definitely investigate witness reports and experiences, provided they're not one-offs and they didn't happen like a year or two or longer ago. I've had people report to me that they want an investigation or call me and they want an investigation. Uh, here's what happened in our house five years ago. Can you come out? We just found out about you. And the answer to that is, what's the point? If nothing has happened in the last five years, I'm happy to take their experience to get the report and talk to them about what might have had happened. But think of it as the ultimate cold case that happened in Crime Alley, where there've been many other crimes that happened since then. There's not even any evidence you can get other than the witness testimony, which you don't need to get on site. I've even had people call me about their ghost experiences after they've moved three times. So we might investigate a case uh, based on rumor or local folklore if there's enough indication that there truly are first-hand accounts that were taken down. So there may could, could be a story about a location, a restaurant, or a place, and his, you do a little research and you find that, hey, people did write about this, people did put in their first-hand experiences, people were interviewed for the newspaper, that might make it worthwhile. But it's pretty rare. And we do not investigate spooky old buildings that have neither one of those. Uh, however, I know a lot of ghost hunting groups that love that. So the most common steps for basic field investigation are pretty simple. Uh, we interview and we interview extensively. Interviewing is, your, is the best skill you can come up with for doing investigations. So that means asking questions and listening and asking more questions. But we may have surveys and such. You try to confirm the statements, including talking to other witnesses, but you too try to rule out fraud and lying and you wanna find out what their motivations are even for reporting. If a site visit is appropriate, you want to think about the potential for alternative sources of the experiences before you go. And then you absolutely wanna look for those when you're there. You wanna to totally observe and thoroughly look at the location and the people themselves. And you may be doing historical and other background research if the type of case refers to that or relates to that. You draw your conclusions and then hopefully you help the clients where help is requested. And all along this, you're gathering data, of course. The basic tools, you have a report intake, you have interviewing, again, that's in bold because it's really important. We might use surveys and polls in investigations. 
We might do records research. We certainly do site visits. We're doing a lot of problem solving in a lot of these cases. And I, I have to be honest, in all the cases I've had, I have yet to have a case where everything reported was related to the apparition, the haunting, or the poltergeist. Individual events or activities that are reported look at, need to be looked at individually because many of what people report in these cases, especially when they're on edge or freaked out, they have alternate explanations. The people immediately label them as paranormal because they've had a genuine or seemingly genuine experience to begin with. We do use tools to measure the environment. We do not use tools to, to measure the ghosts or to communicate in that way. Um, we use tools to look for correlations in the physical environment, not just to the paranormal, but also to alternative explanations. So it helps to have a broad knowledge of possible explanations, including fraud. That's one of the things my, uh, the course that John mentioned, the how to choose a psychic, we'll be talking about psychic fraud in that class as well. And in fact, working with psychics and mediums and investigations. It is really important to have an understanding of the field of parapsychology and laboratory findings, because what we're doing is applying the knowledge and the findings of laboratory work to the field and vice versa. And it also is important to know that it helps to have some counseling skills without being acting as a counselor or therapist if you're not legally able to do that, but you wanna be able to give referrals to people to help them. So from, our, from the perspective of parapsychology, from psychical research, you know, we're studying the experiences and we're studying what's behind the experiences as far as Psy or the paranormal is concerned. We wanna look past the labels that people use. If they call it a demon, you gotta look past that and see what might really be going on. People use all sorts of labels, especially today because of popular culture. Uh, and we have to figure out what lies below them. And we always have to re remember that things are not always paranormal, even though they seem that way, because people make perceptual mistakes, they make conceptual mistakes, meaning they did not have the knowledge base to come to the correct conclusion about what's actually going on, even though it's not paranormal. So we must eliminate all the non-size sources and causes because we're trying to study something and you can't study it if you don't get rid of all the, the crap that's there. So this can include all sorts of explanations. This is not even a full list, by the way. There are, I think the main thing is mistaken perceptions, mistaken conclusions. Uh, I am trained as a magician and mentalist. I, I do perform professionally as a mentalist uh, and am heavily involved in the Psychic Entertainers Association. Uh, what I've learned, my, my background, which only started, by the way, in my parapsychology education, that's given me an understanding of how easy it is for people to make mistakes in their conclusion about what's going on. And I'm not talking about with magicians performing or mentalists, just in general. It's really interesting how people work that way. And it really gives you an insight into people, how people remember things too. We have to know something about environmental conditions because environmental conditions can easily cause mistaken conclusions and bad perceptions. We have to look at things that are physiologically related like sleep paralysis. Psychological issues are certainly there. There's witness bias and testimony, uh, memory involved in testimony. And there can be medical issues, neurological issues specifically. We always have to consider drugs and alcohol. Although when you have a group of people who are having experience, if they truly are each individually having those experiences, that's less likely an issue. Uh, same with the medical and neurological issues, but environmental is definitely potential there. And we have to ask their motivations because motivations do lead to fraudulent reports. I have had people who have actually opened up it right off the bat and said, you know, like, what do you want? I say, what do you want to get out of this case? Uh, do you want help? Do you want it phenomenal to stop? No, no, we're, um, we're going to sell this uh, as a screenplay to such and such a movie company. And that's, a, that's a case I'm not going on. It's very unlikely to be real. And then there is just out and out psychic fraud or those people who pretend to be psychic who have actually uh, created more of a problem. And I have to say that included in that, I would include some of the ghost hunters who are out there who may be unintentionally creating problems, but because they have a lack of knowledge but are professing knowledge that they do not have uh, or expertise that they do not have, they have often created more problems for the families than solutions. 
All right, now we do have truly an ethical conundrum. How do we help people asking for help while getting as much data and testing hypotheses where we can? And the problem here is I want to know what the phenomena is. I want to gather as much as I can. But people, these people have called me and are saying we're, we're traumatized, we're upset, we need help. And that becomes an issue. And frankly, um, if you do take our ethics class, you'll learn that I think it's most important to do what doctors do, which is to do no harm. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, I am part of a panel on next Friday on uh, a poltergeist case that we had here in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley that was totally worked through virtually because of the pandemic. Uh, I think you'll find that session really interesting, especially the part about how we handle this therapeutically as well. So remember that spontaneous experiences do provide the who, what, when, where, and how, uh, under what particular conditions things happen, maybe even hints to the why. You can get that from cases as well. Why these are happening, certainly you can get that. And these are all observations of Psy in the wild. So spontaneous stuff helps us identify patterns which can suggest research hypotheses, perhaps not with apparitions, but certainly in other ways. Uh, we have yet to get an apparition to volunteer to be in the laboratory on a regular basis and got no way to hold them to a schedule. So we do get ideas about what can be researched. And in fact, most of the research on ESP and psychokinesis comes from initially reports that people have had of having these experiences. But then what you find, what you learn from the conclusions, the findings in the laboratory actually can be applied back to understanding spontaneous psi to these experiences. Certainly the experiences of the witnesses, even if we can't apply them always to the apparitions or the haunting phenomena itself. So to sum up, uh, so I think I've hit my half hour mark. <laughs> um, Remember to learn as much as you can. If you've been sitting through this all day, you have learned quite a bit. If you sit through the conference, you will learn quite a bit more. Uh, but definitely delve into what the field has done, not just the laboratory work, but also the field work that folks have done and get an idea of the spread of even opinions and perspectives on the phenomena, these field phenomena from folks within the field, because we don't all agree on the same thing. I mean, what I'm putting out today is general, but honestly, there are folks, who, some of my colleagues who don't agree with me on everything. And that is normal within the process of science. You want that kind of discourse uh, and it should be friendly, not what we see with the ghost hunter groups uh, quite a bit. We wanna apply the science, we wanna apply the findings. So I do applied science. When I do a so-called scientific investigation, which is a big thing for ghost hunters, it seems, uh, really what I'm doing is applying the science because a lot of you can't really work the total scientific method into every investigation. You are really being a detective here and you really do want to be helpful as much as possible. Okay, so last thing I just want to mention is uh, every other Sunday I do something on Facebook Live uh, called Ask Professor Paranormal and people feed me questions and I just spend the hour answering questions. So my next one is tomorrow night, um, Sunday the 18th. Uh, it's 8.30 Eastern time, 5.30 Pacific time, goes for an hour. You'll find it on facebook.com, The Live Paranormal. And if you follow me on Twitter, um, you will see an announcement, or Facebook for that matter, you'll see an announcement about that. I'll be posting something tomorrow just to confirm that. Uh, you can always contact me through my, my email there. Uh, please do consider taking some of the courses at the Rhine Center. Uh, we, uh, we have great courses that, and a, a great group of people who are teaching them. And I mentioned the Forever Family Foundation in my first slide. Uh, this is an organization that supports the work of spirit mediums in the family grieving process, but also supports the research of um, scientists who are doing work looking at survival of bodily death. Uh, I'm very proud to be president of the, the foundation, in fact you can join that one for free. And these are my books. The one in the middle is a novel and we have our second one coming out in a couple of months. Thank you, Lloyd, uh, for that 
very interesting and uh, informative talk. Um, and uh, people have been putting some questions in the Q&A. Please put them in the Q&A and not in the chat. Um, and we'll go through some of those questions. But I think maybe before we hit those questions, at the end, you mentioned you have a live Facebook thing. That yes, yes. So, uh, let, me, let me just you want to update that so. here. Yeah. So first of all, I mentioned a panel that was upcoming. Uh, I had no idea last year that we'd be using this video for this year. <laughs> just sure, like Don. Right. So that um, I did in the chat put a link to the YouTube video of that panel. So you can find that. Um, and then tomorrow night, actually, it is tomorrow night, as it happens. It's just not <laughs> July 18th. It's June 12th. I am doing my Facebook Live. And it can be found on Facebook Live, excuse me, Facebook.com slash The Live Paranormal or Facebook.com slash Lloyd.Auerbach.Author. Either one of those, I will uh, follow the pages. If you go to any other page on Facebook that is also broadcasting that Facebook Live, I will not see your comments or questions. So I just want to tell you that. Good. All right. But they can people can uh, give you comments and questions at that point. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what the whole hour is. It's just okay. a flood of those. Terrific. Because, I mean, and that follows up with a couple of things that have been posted both in the chat and in the Q&A from people who have had experiences like this and are looking for what to do with them. Some people that will pay attention to their um, experiences in, in a meaningful manner. So is it appropriate for them to reach out to you in the, one sure. of those venues? Yeah, as an yeah. I, I think that's fine for that. Um, you know, also I posted, you, if you saw in that last slide, I had my email address up. This word. That's another good way to do that. Um, so, you know, I know people have psychic experiences and I can certainly help point you in the right direction to explain, you know, if it's a simple experience, I might be able to explain it. But a lot of times I guess, why am I having these experiences? And I could nobody can tell you that. <laughs> That's the thing. Right. It's, right. it's There's so many complexities involved in that. Um, but what to do with them is a different story. That's that's a different story. Certainly. All right. Thank you very much. OK, let's see. Um, we'll uh, go up here and do these sort of in the order they've been upvoted, I think, here. So Shay asks, do you and I presume you meaning you, Lloyd, have any <laughs> beliefs as to why we incarnate, reincarnate? Or what is the overarching purpose of our recurring experiences here? No, I'm afraid <laughs> not. Um, you know, it, it's I get asked about, you know, why is such and such a person hanging around as a ghost? And you re, if you read across all sorts of psychics and ghost hunters over time, including Hans Holzer and people like that, there seem to be like a range of reasons why a ghost is still here. And one of the most common ones is, well, they don't know that they're dead. But that's actually clearly not the case in so many of our, our um, of our cases and the reports that witness reports where people are actually communicating. They know they're dead. They may not want to admit that they're dead, but they know they're dead. Um, there's also situations we've had where, according to the witnesses and or the psychics or mediums we're working with, they don't they didn't see the light that we always hear about in the movies and they didn't know what to do. Then we hear they're afraid to move on or that they want to stay in their home or with their family. So the range of reasons seems to be everything. And I tend to think it's the reason why they want to have more ghosts is because there are, number one, psychological reasons on the part of that person who's died. Number two, probably some environmental issues. Maybe the conditions like the Earth's magnetic field, something needs to be right. But I'm guessing also, I mean, I can't speculate on this really, but there may be a spiritual reason of some other kind that's also influencing this too. And that piece we can't get to. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> now, let's see. We have um, I've answered that one already. We'll go to uh, Mikey's. Uh, are haunting simply apparitions that are connected to location based activity? If so, could a haunting become an apparition if some location based business is resolved? Well, first, we tend to we do not refer to an, uh, an apparition who is in a location specifically as a haunting case. So remember, apparition refers to someone who's conscious. Consciousness is important, whereas a typical haunting or residual haunting is place or object location uh, connected. And that has no consciousness. That's just a recording. Um, on the other hand, we were all haunting our homes when we were in lockdown during the pandemic. The word haunt refers to place. And if you watch old movies, especially old film noir movies, they're always talking about finding the old haunts of that guy who, you know, the killer or somebody else. 
uh, for those who are fans of the old TV show, Cheers, Norman Cliff, Haunted Cheers. <laughs> so we haunt places when we're alive, and there's no reason why an apparition won't stay in one place, but they can move around as well. So it's not the case that if we work out the location or figure out the location-based business, unless that's also the apparition's business, nothing's going to change with that apparition. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Shay has another question, but uh, do you think anyone can practice to become effective at connecting with spirit, or is it more of a gift that must come naturally from birth or from some transformational experience such as an NDE? Okay, so first I want to say that uh, many of us in the field believe, wouldn't use the word gift necessarily, other than to say that a ta very talented musician or artist is gifted. That's the same context. So this is not that kind of, it's a talent or you know something, and you can develop that talent. Uh, and we all seem to have some aptitude for something creative. I mean, I, I can actually sculpt pretty well. I cannot mm -hmm. paint or draw to save my life. So that is not my aptitude. And the same thing goes with psychic talents. It seems that some people have an aptitude to become mediums or to get that communication. Some people can read people. I know mediums who cannot read living people and, med and psychics who can't connect with spirits. So we have an aptitude for various talents or applications of psychic ability. There are people who can do, John was mentioning earlier about um, people who are healers can't do PK. Well, that actually makes sense to me because those are two very different applications of psychokinesis. And not everybody who can bend a spoon can affect a device and vice versa. So we have these spread. We can learn to better figure out what we can do. We were all much more psychic when we were kids. We just have to figure out what we're going to be good at. Makes sense. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Randy has an interesting question. It's assumed that living witnesses process their side perception of ghosts via their visual or auditory processing areas of the brain, a psi-induced hallucination. How does the apparition itself utilize psi without a physical brain? All right. And hi, Randy. Randy's a longtime investigator as well. I know pretty well. Well, first, I think that first statement may not be the correct assumption. We don't know if perception just resides wholly in the brain or if it's in consciousness and if consciousness is more than brain. Uh, if consciousness can survive the death of the body, then there's got to be some form of that perceptual process in the body that is not brain related or directly brain related. Maybe the data comes in through the brain, but consciousness does something with it. So the how um, is the same way how they can survive without the brain at all. It's all part of that same thing. So, which means we still are stuck with an answer without an answer. <laughs> That's right. These mechanisms become quite challenging, don't they? Right. <laughs> you know, and the reality is that all these terms, apparition, haunting, poltergeist, they're, they're all placeholders. It's right. a way we can understand what, or at least think we understand what's going on and, and hopefully resolve some situations for the living and the dead. But sure. we may learn that there's something else that we've been missing all along. And that's really important to remember. Mm -hmm. um, and there's another question from Paul that's sort of uh, related to the, the previous one. You said a prerequisite for the experience is perception. However, many occurrences are filmed or photographed and available to be viewed by anyone. That would imply an actual physical disturbance independent of the observers. Well, first, I would challenge that statement. Because most ghost photos, and especially if they're orb related, not paranormal at all. Uh, they have other photographic or uh, or video explanations for so many of them. You know, if a physical object's moving, that's a whole different story. But even then, we have to kind of consider what's going on. the The assumption is, and this is something that goes back. This is well before me. Is that if something shows up on film or on digital, it is because that entity, that apparition, is affecting the device or the recording medium. That is effectively what's going on with EVP. If a spirit is putting a voice on the recording medium or on the device, that is by nature psychokinesis. It's a form of mind over matter. The apparition is just a mind. They're affecting matter or energy. That is PK. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> My elect is talking to me, sorry. <laughs> that's fine. That's John asked. <laughs> it's those apparitions. Yeah. John, John asked, from the void. <laughs> are there apparitions from centuries ago or only from recent times? 
there are, you know, there are actually reports of certainly hauntings that have gone on for centuries. And there are reports occasionally that um, there may be interactive apparitions from centuries ago as well. Certainly not in places where there has not been human habitation or connection to anybody for centuries. Uh, so you're more likely to find hauntings and or apparitions from much longer ago in less um, develop in, in, I should say, if places that have been developed a lot longer ago than other places. So for example, here in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, um, you don't have a lot of old ghosts or hauntings, certainly no hauntings in San Francisco proper for the most part, with a couple of exceptions before the 1906 earthquake, because all those buildings were destroyed or most of them were destroyed. Quite a bit of the city was, was on fire or was destroyed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but and in the suburbs, you know, unless we 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 do have a haunting imprint that's been reported in a local park area, uh, which re relates to a, a minimal or kind of a minor battle or skirmish between some native population and some settlers from the 1800s. But other than that, we don't get too much back before when humans were habitating at that point. So it just really depends on the location. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Stephen asks, do you have an opinion on the skull experiments? And maybe for those who may not know what they are, you might. Oh, I just lost, lost your audio, Mark. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you now. <laughs> All right. I, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I can see the question. So, okay. so you want me to mention what, so skull uh, was a series of experiments conducted um, in the UK by Robin Foy and others. And uh, there's actually a few documentaries out. There's, I believe there's going to be a major motion picture on the subject coming up as well, a dramatic version of that, where these researchers decided to try to contact spirits. And they got a lot of physical manifestations uh, in the dark and some other, some really interesting communication. There are several books on the subject. I do recommend them. Uh, I, you know, my opinion is that these were very sincere, honest researchers um, I, I don't have any specific opinion about whether who they contacted was actually who they said they were, or even if the researchers themselves might not have caused the phenomena them, uh, unconsciously. So that's always a question that comes up in physical mediumship for that matter. Uh, but it's a really interesting thing. And, I, and actually, one of the I participated in one of the documentaries, the Afterlife Investigations, uh, that was done years ago about the skull, um, skull work. And it's on, I think it's on, it may be on YouTube, it's certainly on Amazon Prime or one of the others. That's available for free. Okay, good. <clears throat> Shay asks, what led to your interest in this field? I was a weird little kid. <laughs> I um, honestly, I was a, a science geek as a kid, especially interested in space science. My dad actually worked for NBC and uh, was involved in the coverage of the Mercury and Gemini space shot. At the same time, I had a TV set in my room when I was two because my dad worked for NBC. And I started watching shows like Topper, and one step beyond in the Twilight Zone before I was even four years old. Um, and that got me interested in folklore and kind of as a side by side with science. And then came Dark Shadows. <laughs> and uh, actually comic books were in there as well. So comic books were raising the question of can human beings be more than what we think we are? And Dark Shadows introduced me to the term parapsychology verbally. I'd read it in a comic book once before. Uh, in fact, I'm just reading a book about accounts of kids who all ran home at, uh, at, at four o'clock to watch Dark Shadows. <laughs> all of us were around the same age called Running Home to Shadows, um, which is really fun. But that sent me to the library and I found not only books on vampires and werewolves, which, of course, are in Dark Shadows, but also books on parapsychology, which unfortunately, due to the Dewey Decimal System, are in the same section of the library. So it was folklore that led me to the science and reading the books by Ryan and Pratt and other folks that got me heavily interested in the subject. It's a mystery. And I wanted to solve this mystery, be involved in the solving of this mystery. Oh, uh, let's see. I'll try this one here. How can we balance the scholar skepticism versus participants collaboration, <coughs> the, the classic anthropological problem? Um, at what time does a researcher scientific approach might get in the way of properly approach the phenomena or help the experiencers. All right. So, and this is something we deal with in our ethics course for the Ryan Research Center, Ryan Education Center. Um, and it, it's, first of all, I mean, I often call myself a situational skeptic that 
I do believe in Psy. I do believe in the phenomena. Clearly, you've heard me talk about this this way. But each individual case has to be looked at in a true skeptical perspective, not a disbelieving perspective. But is it Psy? You know, if you're watching the Netflix show, is it cake? It's the same kind of thing. Is it Psy? Is something psychic happening here? And is that thing over there that they reported psychic or paranormal versus this thing over here, which seems really to fit into the apparition or haunting or poltergeist thing? So we have to kind of pull those apart. That's kind of scientific skeptical thinking, but that is to figure out what's going on. At some point, depending on the case and depending on the part the people, the witnesses who have called you for help, A, have they called you for help because they're disturbed? So at that point, that is an overriding ethical concern. And I will often throw science out the window, the scientific method certainly out the window, in order to help people work through what's going on, even when it has a normal explanation. We have to kind of couch things in different terms. People often feel, unfortunately, if you don't explain it to them right, they feel stupid and insulted. And there's so much that we run into that a normal person wouldn't have that in their back pocket of knowledge, or they've made assumptions based on TV or something else, that we have to explain it in ways that make them feel okay, kind of like, if you, you know, one of the problems I, that we deal with in the magic world is that somebody wants to know how it's something is done. Uh, they get really insistent. And if you actually tell them, 50% of the people get mad. <laughs> the other 50% think that's really cool. But yeah, the, the people get mad. We try to avoid those people. That's right. Um, uh, Shalom Masudov, do you think this could be inherited through bloodline? So the question of nature or nurture comes up quite a bit. There seems to be a hereditary factor here for sure. But the other thing that's just as important, if not possibly more important, is the family that you grew up in and the culture that you're in. Uh, and how supportive is, is it? So I've talked to people, psychics, who were psychic from being a kid and their parents were extremely supportive and actually treated them like this was all normal uh, or kind of enhanced, helped enhance that. And uh, then there are other people who, who have one parent that does and another parent that doesn't. And so they gravitate toward the parent that does support them. So it's it's a difficult thing to say whether or not this is just genetic. It's certainly not just the nurture part. Sure. And that's always hard to unpack when things run in families, right? It's, oh, it is. It is. Yeah, right. Uh, Shay wants to know any thoughts on what shadow people are, i.e. apparitions that appear to move in a human way, but look essentially like a dark show with no discernible details. So, so first of all, um, a lot of the things we see on the TV shows, the reality shows that they're calling shadow people are not, even though they are shadows that show up in night shot cameras uh, or on the night shot in the dark. And that's because the night shot cameras actually have a spotlight. It's infrared and it causes shadows. So putting those aside, mm -hmm. there are experiences people have where that figure in shadow seems to behave or move around like a normal, like it, it, like a regular person. And that is very likely that you as the percipient, the person who's experiencing that, uh, that figure is not getting, let's say, getting the full broadcast. You're, you're getting a partial broadcast. You're, there's too much static here. So you perceive it, uh, perceive that figure as a shadowy figure, or even sometimes as a light. Sometimes it goes both ways for that. Uh, there should be no inherent negativity about it being shadowy or fuzzy. It just means the reception's not good. Now, there are other types, there are other shadow figures that are reported by people that people claim to be in the shape of an extraterrestrial or in something else. And we really don't know what to make of some of those. Okay. Um, I got a note here that we do need to wrap this up because we have a 615 talk. Um, and uh, there still seems to be interest. Will you be sticking around after the 615 for the 715 social hour if people wish? I sure to? will because it's much earlier here for me in California. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So that's terrific. So thank you. Let's all give a big round of applause to Lloyd here. Thank you very much. And um, you can uh, join him at 7.15 in the Social Lounge. We'll be ending this session, um, but the next session will start shortly. You'll get put back in the Social Lounge, but um, only for a couple of minutes until uh, our final session, uh, our final talk by Paul Smith starts in just a few minutes. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Okay.